So hey guys welcome back to my channel again so sorry for not uploading videos I was hospitalized due to some issues now I will upload videos continuously so yeah today we are going to see what if Harry Potter got trained as Dragon Slayer this is a movie I hope you will love this. So let's begin Lily, he's here, take Harry and run, I'll hold him off. Lily Potter nay Evans sprinted away from her husband's yelling voice, clutching their child to her chest, and mumbling prayers to any being that might be listening. As she heard a cruel laugh and a thud coming from the floor beneath her she sobbed, already knowing what had happened to her husband. She placed Harry into his crib and began to frantically chant, hoping to activate the protective runes that she had placed around his crib weeks before in case this exact thing happened. As the runes began to light up she looked into her son's eyes and whispered. Mama loves you Harry, Dada loves you too. Stay strong baby, remember that we love you with all our hearts. The door blasted open to show the tall robed figure of Lord Voldemort. He swept into the room with his wand in his hand, a sneer on his face as he took in the two people that he had come to kill. He took no notice of the room that surrounded the child. Instead his eyes alighted upon the mother that stood protectively in front of the crib. Stand aside silly girl, stand aside and I shall spare you your life, he hissed, having no actual inclination to do so. In his mind, a mudblood was always a mudblood no matter what he had promised his followers, or how accomplished said Mudblood was. Not Harry, please anybody but Harry, kill me instead, the desperate mother sobbed. Stand aside girl, please, anybody but Harry, as you wish then, Mudblood, the Dark Lord hissed. Avada Kedavra. With a shocking green light the woman fell down, her body falling over the runic pattern, her fingers scratching away at the dried ink that made up the protection. Instead of the runes just being for protection, now there was a second clause. Transportation of the protected if harmed. Voldemort walked closer to the crib, a triumphant sneer on his face as he looked down at the crying baby in front of him. How could this child be destined to defeat him, Lord Voldemort? He was the most powerful wizard no matter what the sheeple thought of Albus Dumbledore. He turned his wand to the child's forehead and as he hissed out the two hateful words that had brought so much death and destruction. The runes activated, bouncing the spell back towards its caster, though the barrier could not stop the cut that appeared on the child that it surrounded. The baby wailed as the second clause kicked in, and Harry Potter was sent away from one world of magic, to another one. Hey, Dad? A young boy of five asks his father, looking down into large red eyes from his perch on his father's back. Yes Ryos. His father rumbles. How did I become your son? I mean it's pretty obvious that I'm not yours. As his father laughs, Ryos scrambles to get a purchase on his father's back. Come on, dad. Don't shake the little human off while you're laughing. I thought that we had been through this. Ah, sorry, sorry, the non-human chuckles. Anyway, it was four years ago on a cold and windy day. A cold breeze whooshed through a dry, dark cave, making the hulking figure within shake its head with a sigh. Damn wind. It's almost as if the wind's trying to bring me something. The figure chortled. Hey, as if. If that happens, I'll keep whatever it gives me, and never doubt the wind again. I was relaxing in our cave, combating the wildly blowing wind with all I had. The wind was so bad, that it nearly blew me right out of the cave. Dodd. You know that's not possible right? You're too fat for the wind to be able to move you. Shut up, brat. I'm telling you a damn story, and you'd better listen to it. Silence. The father huffed. Good. Now, I was just trying to enjoy a meal when suddenly. The wind gave an almighty howl, and the sky outside the cave grew brighter and brighter with a magical glow. The figure stretched out its long neck, one wickedly clawed foot scraping across the ground as it stood. What's going on? Is that damned Wysolohia doing something again? I thought I told him just what I'd do to him if he did this kind of shit while I was sleeping. The male cursed. That damned light dragon is gonna get it. The dragon looked out of the cave, ready to start cursing and yelling at his not friend when he noticed that something was different about the light. Runes were lit up and moving together in a band. The bright light coming from them and the white glow coming from the middle of the band. A baby's cry could be heard coming from the light as it came closer and closer to the mouth of the cave. The light came to a stop just in front of the hulking dragon, and as the light dimmed, it revealed a small child wrapped in a blanket. What the hell? 
you were swept straight into the cave by the wind, naked and one of the most disgustingly stinky babies I've ever had the displeasure of coming across. The dragon huffed. The child on his back hit him hard on the back so that his father could feel it of course. I'm the only baby that you've come across, dad, it's still true. Said the dragon. Although not necessarily the truth, the untrue telling of the story was giving his son something to laugh about something that had begun to happen less often. Skiadrum was glad that even though his son wasn't showing his emotions as much as he used to, he still knew how to smile and laugh openly. It would be hard for his son to do so soon, and the dragon was taking the chance that he had now to try and see as much of his son's smile as he could. Shadow Dragon's Roar A large whirlwind of darkness came from a young boy's mouth as he faced off against his best and only friend. White Dragon's Roar A second boy yelled out the same attack, though this one was much different. Instead of a tunnel of light, the attack came out as a laser that splashed against the darker attack, turning the fight into a battle of wills. Both boys put everything that they had into their attacks, knowing that if they lost there would be hell to pay. Two dragons watched them fight, smirking at each other as the two boys struggled to overcome each other. One was as dark as night and seemed to meld into the shadows that it created around it, while the other was as bright as the sun, making a sharp contrast to its companion. Both of them anxiously waited for the battle to be over, trying to show the other that they were the better father and the better mentor. The darkness began to slowly overcome the bright laser, making the child who controlled the laser panic and try even harder. The darkness slowed its progress until it came to a stop, closer to the blonde, but still able to be pushed back toward its caster. The blonde child gritted his teeth, his entire being looking like the light that he cast. His clothing was bright and went along with his shining blonde hair and personality. His counterpart, on the other hand was the complete opposite. Dark clothing draped over him, matching his quiet nature and his slightly messy black hair that covered his right eye, as well as a very light scar in the shape of a lightning bolt. The standstill went on for a while longer until, suddenly, the dark child moved, cancelling his roar and slipping into the shadows to travel behind his lighter friend. He raised his fist and with a muttered shadow dragon's claw sent it down towards the other's head. It connected, and the blonde fell to the ground, only to roll and spin to face his opponent once more. The two looked at each other, one waiting for movement, while the other grew impatient. Holy Nova! The blonde screamed, rushing towards Rayo's, a blinding light coming from his hands. Rayo's bent his legs, waiting for the opportune moment to strike. His friend swung at his head and Rayo's crouched low a leg shooting out to sweep his opponent's legs from underneath him. The blonde falls with a yelp, and his father groans as Rayos places a foot on his chest and s his head at the other boy. Do you give up, Sting? Rayos asks. Sting glares at Rayos petulantly, annoyed that his friend had beaten him once again. A few seconds pass as he stews in anger until he answers, yes. The darker dragon laughs uproariously. Ha ha. Take that Wysolohia. Yet another win for my son. Wysolohia growls. Shut up, Skiadrum. Yours definitely cheated. He did not, he won due to his own skill, he did too. The two dragons began to wrestle with each other, rolling around on the ground as their sons watched in amusement. Hey, Rayos? Sting asks. Yes? Why are our dads so stupid? Rayos huffs, because they just are aw, that makes sense. Dad? Dad? Are you all right? Rayos asked worriedly. The dragon gave a hacking cough as he tried to say that he was fine. Rayos shushed him and pointed to the lake that the two sat next to, ordering his father to drink from it, to soothe his throat. Rayos, began Skiadrum scratchily. I need to ask something of you. Something that will do me a great favor, as well as giving you something as well. Rayos looked at him with wide eyes. What is it, Dad? I'll do anything to help you. The dragon looked at his son, staring hard into their currently green gaze, though the dragon knew that they would change to red after this. Come, Rayos. We need to go back to our cave to do this. The flight to the cave was short and silent with tension. Once back in the cave, the dragon curled around his son, dreading what he was about to do to Rayos. What he was about to ask his son would kill any and all emotions that he had left, but it would have to be done. Rayos. You know that I am very sick, Skiadrum started with a cough, and I know that I will not live to see past this illness but. No, Dad you can't die. I need you to be with me, I need you to see me accomplish all of the things that I want to do in life. 
Rayo's sobbed, his hold on his emotions shattering with the prospect of his father's death. Rayo's, I know that this is hard, but I need you to listen to me, and I also need you to promise that you will do whatever I tell you, no matter how much you don't want to. The dragon wrapped his young son up in a hug as he spoke, giving the hiccuping boy as much comfort as he could before he would have to go. He felt Rayo's nod and heard a small mutter of a promise, he would do whatever his father asked him to. The dragon sighed, starting another round of hacks that left him aching for air. He struggled to control his breath and continued, needing his son to do this for him. Rayo's, I need you to kill me. His son looked up at him in shock, eyes wide and mouth open, tears and snot running down his face. W what? Rayo's whimpered, hoping to have misheard his dad. I need you to a cough rippled through Skiadrum. I need you to kill me, and take my power. It will come out as a lacrima, and you should insert it into yourself when you are older, it will make you stronger than ever. No I can't dad, I can't kill you, Rayo's yelled. You must, Rayo's, remember your promise. It was very quiet for a few minutes, save for the small whimpers that came from the child wrapped in the dragon's limbs. All right, whispered Rayo's. I'll do it nay, Gajil. A small child of ten asked, looking up at a very intimidating teen. What is it, Rayo's? I have work to do, brat. The teen answered, looking down at the child with slanted red eyes. Are you really going to start a war with Fairy Tail? Wide green eyes looked into the slanted red ones glaring at them, they seem really nice. Does it matter? They're fairy trash, the fact that they're nice only puts them more under my feet. Being nice is a weakness, Rayo's, remember that. Yes, Gajil a green cat sat shivering in an alleyway, rain falling all around it. It looked around scared, hoping that the mean kids wouldn't come back to hurt it. A shuffling sound made it look up scared that its attackers had returned. Instead he looked into the green eyes of a teen that had crouched in front of it. Pretty. The cat whispered. What's pretty? asked the teen. Your eyes. Me thinks that they're pretty. The teen stared stoically back at the cat. He extended his hand towards the cat with his palm up. Would you like to come with me? I'll keep you safe and warm, the teen said, no warmth entering his tone. The cat looked at the teen's hand and then at his face with wide glistening eyes. Me wants to. The teen nodded and picked the cat up. What's your name? Mine's Rogue. I don't have one, came the soft reply. The teen looked down at the cat in his arms. Do you know what you want as a name? Frosh. I like it. Frosh thinks so too. Are you ready, rogue? A blonde teenager asked, his eyes narrowing in excitement as he looked at his best friend. A grunt answered him, the red eyed teenager looking back at his childhood friend. Sting will win, and you'll win too, rogue. A red cat wearing a vest yelled out. Fro thinks so too. A green cat in a frog suit yelled as well, hugging the dark haired teen. A small smile curled on Rogue's face as he looked down at his cat friend. Yeah, those fairies won't know what him them after they face the twin dragons of Sabretooth, Sting crowed, throwing an arm over cloaked shoulders. Rogue's small twitch of a smile curled up into a smirk. Gajil wouldn't know what hit him. Four people stood across from each other, two facing two. A man with pink hair and a fiery disposition stood next to a man that had long crazy black hair held back with a bandana. This man had multiple piercings not only in his ears, but also all over his body. Both men had tattoos in the shape of a fairy on their right shoulders. Facing the two stood two opposites, both in disposition and color. A blonde faced the fiery man, a wise smirk on his face as he looked at his childhood hero. Next to him stood a man dressed in all black that looked at the pierced man with no emotions, taking in the vision of his surrogate older brother, now enemy. The two had tattoos of a tiger on their shoulders. The four stood in an arena, surrounded by screaming spectators and comrades as they waited for their battle to begin. There was a hush as the announcer, a small man that wore a pumpkin mask announced for the fighters to get ready. The four crouched, preparing to fight as soon as the word begin was yelled. With a loud gong and a scream from the announcer, the four moved in unison, they could not and would not lose this battle. It was a battle between sabers and fairies a showdown between the current strongest guild, and the guild that had fallen from grace when its core members had seemingly died. One guild looking to humiliate the other, while the other looked to redeem itself and to avenge one of the guild's members. The two fairies rush at their opponents, punching them in the face before the sabers can even react. 
The two dark-haired men square off, one shouting out, Shadow Dragon Slash. As he ran towards the other you yelled, Iron Dragon's Sword, and used his arm that had turned into a wickedly sharp sword to bat away the Shadow Mage. A laser suddenly curved towards the metal-armed man as the Shadow Mage's partner tried to give him some time to recuperate. He was unable to help, however, as his opponent hit both him and his shadowy partner with a screamed Fire Dragon's Wing attack. The crowd screamed in approval as the older dragon slayers stared the younger slayers down. This was the power of fairy tale mages. They would redeem their guild, and they would take back the title of the strongest guild in Fury. In another dimension, one that also had magic but was different in all other ways was also holding a tournament. This tournament was not new, but very old and hadn't been held due to death rates spiraling out of control. Albus Dumbledore Headmaster of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry looked upon a crowd of students from three different schools, wondering just how this tournament would go. He needed the tournament to go well, for if his suspicions were correct, the Dark Lord was growing in power and was trying to regain a body. He needed the support from other countries if the upcoming war was to happen. He didn't want the war, he truly wanted a peaceful negotiation, but if he knew his opponent, whom he did, then peace would not be an option, only war. He raised his arms as he projected, Welcome to the Triwizard Tournament. The gathered students tensed, this was the moment that they had been waiting for, they would finally know just who would represent their school, who would bring their school to glory. Now is the time, the old man continued, to find out just which one of your peers will compete in this momentous tournament. Now we wait for the goblet to make its choice. He looked at the goblet of fire and then at the students. He sighed inwardly as his eyes wandered to a table where he had hoped one student would sit, but that would never happen. Harry Potter had been missing ever since the night where he had defeated the Dark Lord Voldemort. He had loved the Potters as if they were his own children, and it saddened him that he would never be able to teach their son at his school. His attention was brought back to the goblet when its flames turned blue and from its depths, sprouted a piece of parchment, slightly charred and frilled. He grabbed it out of the air and looked at the name within. The champion of Bobadans is Fleur Delacour, he pronounced grandly, smiling as the students sat at the Ravenclaw table erupted into applause, and some in tears as a beautiful young woman walked up and into a room just off of the teacher's table. He looked to the goblet again as another name erupted from it. Lightly snatching the paper he said, the Durmstrang champion is Victor Crumb. The students at the Slytherin table clapped politely along with all of the Quidditch Stars fans and classmates. The noise was considerably louder for this champion. He looked to the goblet one last time waiting to see the champion for his school. With a shaky breath he looked at the piece of parchment and smiled widely at the name. This was a student that he could proudly stand behind. The Hogwarts champion is Cedric Diggory. The noise from the Hufflepuff table was loud enough to burst eardrums, as the other tables, besides the Slytherin table of course, joined in the noise. He looked back at the students when the noise ceased. He smiled and began to dismiss the students when the goblet spouted one more piece of paper. His good mood vanished, what now? What would happen to his school this year? He looked at the parchment, his bushy eyebrows rose high as he looked at the name. Harry Potter? Rogue looked around the arena as an unnatural wind picked up, a voice carrying through it. Sting pulled up next to him, panting as he looked at his partner worriedly. Their opponents stopped as well, looking around as magic filled the arena. Oi, salamander, what's going on? The pierced man said, wiping blood from his mouth. His salmon-haired friend looked at him dumbfounded. Do I look like I know what this is, metalhead? Salamander, yelled. Well, if you wouldn't keep bringing freaky new abilities to fights, maybe I wouldn't have to ask, fire freak. What was that, asshole? Sting and Rogue looked at each other in and then at their opponents. Rogue looked to the stands seeing his exceed friend and smiling slightly. Frosh worried about him, he knew, and it wouldn't do to worry him too badly. He looked back to the other fighters, nearly showing emotion at them as they rolled around and wrestled with each other during a fight. They stopped though as the wind picked up again, more forcefully this time, pitching Rogue forward along with the other fighters. His eyes widened marginally as a blue pulsing light appeared in the middle of the arena, seemingly pulling the slayers into it. The wind was blowing continuously now, ing the slayers into it as they tried to get away. Rogue, what's going on? Sting yelled as he tried to back away. I don't know, it's the same as Natsu said how would I know? He said loudly, 
attracting shocked looks from Gajil and Natsu. Rogue. A green cat slammed into his back and tried to help him get away. Frosh. What are you doing? He questioned. He hugged his exceed closely to his body as he saw the other's exceeds try the same, one transforming into a larger version of itself and plunging a sword into the ground to keep both him and Gajil on the ground. With an almighty roar, the wind blew around the arena, gathering all of the slayers up into its stream and gustily threw them into the bright light. The light grew larger, pulsing with energy as the magic did its purpose. Though it had brought passengers with it, the main requirement had been fulfilled, and that was all that really mattered. Harry Potter had been transported unwillingly home. In the Great Hall, Albus stared at the bright blue light that had appeared shortly after Harry Potter's name had passed his lips. He was slightly surprised, as he had never thought that he would be able to meet his would-be protege, but his apprehension slowly turned to excitement. With Harry helping him, it would be easier to defeat Voldemort. The prophecy had stated that Harry was the only one who could defeat the Dark Lord, and now that he had come home. Albus would be able to train him and help him defeat the great evil that had been lurking for nearly fifty years. As the light dimmed, Albus straightened, wanting to present a good view for the fourteen-year-old that would soon be here. He did not, however, expect the four teenagers that fell to the ground in a mighty heap, nor the odd-looking cats that they carried with them. He looked at the four more closely, looking for the one that he would soon call his student as they stood up, brushing off dirt and seemingly growling at each other. Nothing had prepared him for this. Where are we? Hey, light bulb, what the hell did you do? Lose control over an attack. We're not even in fury anymore. What was that, flame brain? This wasn't my fault, so you can off, are you sure that it wasn't yours? Gee, the pyro's too stupid to be able to do something like this. You though would be stupid enough to do something like this so that you could win the fight. Nay, nay, rogue. Fro sees people staring at us. Froze scared. That stopped all of the commotion. The stoic teen had already noticed all of the other people in the room, but all of the others in the group hadn't noticed until the green cat had said something. Albus took a deep breath and stepped forward, smiling nicely at the group. Hello, my name is Albus Dumbledore. Might I ask who you are? Silence greeted his words as the group looked at him confused. Albus gave a little, oh of realization and waved his wand, saying as he did so, at his verbus animos anglicus. There was a stir of magic as the English language was uploaded to the group's mind. What the was that, old man? growled the teen that had too many piercings. Language young man. Were you not taught manners when you were raised? A sharp voice cut across the silence. Professor McGonagall glared sternly at the group of teens, daring them to curse again. The teen grinned, laughing oddly as he replied. I was raised with all of the manners that my asshole dad had, so none. The pink haired teen snorted at his statement along with the rest of the group. To answer your question, young man, I simply added my language to your mind so that we could understand each other. Would you all follow me so that we may speak in private? It could help to get to the bottom of all this. Albus tried again. Thank you for that, it would have been difficult to get anything across the language barrier. Albus stared in shock as the small black cat replied to his statement with a fully matured voice. We'll follow you to your office, but only after we know your name and where we are. Albus nodded his head. They all looked like warriors, cautious and ready to strike at any threat that may come to them. My name is Albus Dumbledore, and I am the headmaster of this school, Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Hogwarts. What a stupid the pink-haired teen started cut off when his mouth was covered by the blue cat that sat on his shoulder. Natsu, we don't know how strong he is. What if he's like Lucy, where she'll kick you through the ceiling when we read her novel? Or like Urza, remember when she nearly killed you for destroying her cake? The group snickered as Natsu's face turned stark white with fear, though the rest of the group was looking at him warily now. Albus wondered just how strong these girls are if they would be able to kick grown men through a ceiling. Now, follow me please. Albus looked at the two men from the ministry, Ludo, Barty, I will be with you shortly, please inform the champions what has just happened. The two men nodded and left with the other headmaster and headmistress to talk with the students. Albus turned back to the rest of the gathered students. While there has been much excitement tonight, it is time for you all to go to bed. So pip, pip, off you go. With a large amount of noise that had the group all wincing and rubbing their ears, the students left the great hall gossiping about all that had occurred. 
Albus turned back to the group of foreigners, and then to his teachers. He smiled lightly and turned to lead them all to his office. The walk was quiet, the group of strangers all staring at the castle around them. The pictures on the walls all chatting and running after the odd group, trying to get a glimpse of the visitors. One painting of a knight nearly caused a fight, the man in the painting had taunted the stoic teen's green cat, causing him to growl and surge towards the painting. Maybe he wasn't as emotionless as Albus had thought. Once they were all in his office, with Albus and his teachers facing the foreigners, the tense silence broke. Well, now that we are all here, would you please tell us your names? Albus asked. None of the foreigners said anything for a second until the pink-haired one Natsu, was it, spoke up. Hi, there, my name's Natsu Dragnil, and this is my partner, Happy, Ichi said with a grin. The name's Gajil Red Fox, and that's Lily, went the long-haired teen. With a wise smirk the blonde said, Sting Euclid, one of the twin dragons. This is Lecter. The silent guy is rogue and the cat's frosh. Albus looked at them thoughtfully. None of them went by Harry Potter, but that was just a name. If he could find which one was Harry, then that teen would have to participate in the games. Albus, none of them are the boy that we are looking for. Look at them all. They are much older than fourteen. Not one of them is Harry Potter. Minerva said with a sniff. Now, now, my dear Minerva, Harry Potter is just a name, you wouldn't expect a one-year-old baby to remember its name now would you? Albus said trying to placate the woman. A shudder ran through Sting and Rogue when Albus said, Minerva. They looked at the professor worriedly, as if she would suddenly attack them. Who's Harry Potter? Who's Harry Potter? asked Natsu. He didn't know how or why he was in this other world, but if he could return to his own by finding this, Harry Potter, guy, then he would do his damn best. He had a tournament to win. Adventure was all well and good, but he needed to make fairy tale the greatest. Harry Potter is someone that we have been looking for, for a very long time. That was the old man, Dumbledore, or something. He defeated a dark lord when he was just a baby and hasn't been seen since. The only reason why all of you were pulled into this place is because the Goblet of Fire pulled Harry Potter from where he was, to here. Natsu stared, confused. One in their group had defeated a dark lord when he was a baby. It couldn't have been him. Igniel would have told him if he smelled weird, like poor Lyusica. But then, none of them really smelled weird. Natsu thought for a second, breathing deeply. Nope. The only one that smelled weird was that rogue guy, and that was because he smelled like darkness, but that made sense, seeing as he was the shadow dragon slayer. Natsu shrugged and looked at the professor. None of us smell like this world, is your goblet broken, old man, he said with a toothy grin. Smell. Your nose can't be that powerful, stop lying to us child. A nasally voiced man with greasy hair sneered. Dumdor looked at him sharply. Regardless, Professor Snape, of whether or not he is telling the truth, I have a way to check. The silver-haired man looked at them all grandly. This spell shows the original name of the person, or persons in question. The first name that you had, the one that your parents gave you will be shown. And with that, he swished his wand in a circle and said, Nomine Rebellio. Natsu looked around as the room's occupants all shone for small moment and then had their names revealed to them as shining letters, all in English. Aetherius Natsu Dragnil. He read. Aetherius. Where did that come from? He didn't want to think about it anymore. He looked around the room, noticing that all of them had their own names the ones that they currently went by, except for Rogue. Rogue had two names flashing around him, it was almost as if they were trying to cancel the other out. One looked like Rayo's, and that one kind of made sense, but the other was. Harry Potter. Rogue read out in shock. Sure. His dad had told him stories of how he had come to him on a wind, along with a flashing light, but this was ridiculous. He couldn't have actually been telling the truth. Rogue's world had come to a screeching halt. He was from another world, not Fury like he had originally thought. He took a deep shuddering breath and hugged Frosh, trying not to panic, trying not to show a weakness to these strangers, to Gajil. Rayos? You're that little punk Rayos? Gajil asked, shocked. He remembered that little kid the one that had looked up to him, had thought of him as a brother when he was in Phantom Lord. That the little shit had turned into this. Emotionless person made him sad, which was weird. He didn't do the whole, feeling for others thing that Salamander did, but, this was his little brother, his little admirer. 
When Rogue No Reyes nodded, he suddenly realized just why this kid had been gunning to beat him so badly, he would have too, if their situations had been reversed. He was interrupted in his thoughts when all the noise started. What just happened? Where did Natsu and the others go? Was that like Edelus? Can they come back, or can we go to them? The crowd at the Grand Magic Games was abuzz with shock. The four fighters, all four essential to their respective teams were gone. The mages at Sabretooth and Fairy Tail were the most shocked, though Fairy Tail was so much more devastated than the other guild. Would they be able to come back? It was similar to the Edelus debacle, yet it was much weirder, and much more specific. W. Well, that was certainly unexpected, K. Cabo. It seems like the combatants from both Fairy Tail and Sabretooth have disappeared. Um, please hold on for a moment as we discuss how to go on from here, Cabo. The pumpkin headed announcer walked away from Arena looking nervous. The arena grew noisy with voices asking for information while both Fairy Tail and Sabretooth members sat in shock. The two guilds had each lost four of their members, important members. They looked at each other from across the stands, one mostly uncaring and the other in near tears at the loss of their Nakama. The mages from Fairy Tail looked back to their first master as well as their sixth for advice. What could they do to get Gajil, Natsu, Happy and Lily back? The office exploded with noise making the dragon slayers cringe and clap their hands over their ears. Hey! Mind the noise ass hats. All of the professors turned towards Gajil, offended. He scoffed at the looks he was getting and crossed his arms. We get that you're in shock and all, but some of us have sensitive hearing, so zip it, ya hear. He glared at the wizards in front of him, before glancing at his fellow mages, eyes lingering on Rayo's. What's going to happen now? Rogue asked quietly, Frosh still nestled in his arms. The four of us have a tournament to get back to, as well as guilds. We can't stay for your own tournament. He lips twitched upwards as Frosh exclaimed. Fro thinks so too. The Exceed gained shocked glances when he talked, though he was dismissed quickly. Living with magic will do that to a person. Rogue glared at Dumbledore as the old man sighed, sadly, my boy, you will have to stay for the year, because you were chosen by the Goblet of Fire, and are therefore bound magically to compete. Rogue stopped glaring, shocked. Beside him, Sting started to incoherently yell and babble along with Salamander, though Gajil just looked shocked out of his mind. We can't go home then. B but Natsu, what's going to happen to Lushy? And Carla? And the rest of the Blue Exceed's statement became indiscernible because of his sobbing. Salamander bent down to comfort him, but raised his voice as well. How are we going to get home? Our Nakama need us. Natsu looked down worriedly at Happy, who was still sobbing into his chest. Lucy, he murmured. We can discuss that tomorrow, but for now, I believe that you must meet the rest of the champions, Harry, my boy. Dumbledore said clapping his hands. His eyes were twinkling brightly, creeping out the slayers. The twinkle dimmed, however, as he heard a mumble from the boy in question, saying, I'm not Harry, I'm Rogue, and I'm not your boy. Dumbledore turned, seemingly ignoring Rogue, and began to walk towards the Great Hall once again so that he could introduce the travelers to the other champions. The professors followed after their headmaster, minds still reeling from what they had learned. The four dragon slayers traded looks and followed warily. The four dragon slayers hadn't really been paying attention to their surroundings when traveling to Dumbledore's office. But now that they had acclimated, Natsu, Gajil, Sting, Rogue, and their exceeds stared around at the moving photos that talked, Natsu tried to fight a wayward knight that would not stop talking, staircases that had minds of their own. Lecter nearly got left behind when he got stuck in a trick stair as well as the hidden passageways and walking suits of armor, of which Gajil tried to take a bit of, but was pulled away by Panther Lily. When the group entered the Great Hall, the eyes of the travelers went up to look at the ceiling. Whoa, breathed Natsu. So cool. The rest of his group made noises of agreement, mouths agape in awe. A cough interrupted them in their revelry, and they turned to look at the aged headmaster who was gesturing them into a side room that was situated to the left of the head table. The group of fighters walked up to the door with the rest of the group, and entered through the door. There was a stony silence as the two guilds faced off. The two masters stared at each other, each hoping that the other would blink first in a show of submission. A ghostly pale form of a small woman stood between them looking back and forth until she finally grew tired of their childish posturing and stepped between them, making herself visible to all. Fairy Tail's first master, 
Mavis Vermilion was going to get the members of each guild back, and she was going to start the mission right then and there. She hadn't, however, counted on the shock that the Sabretooth members would show at her appearance, she was just happy that she was incorporeal. As the third, sixth, and eighth master roared along with the rest of the guild at the attempt upon her person, she held up a small hand, quieting them. It's quite all right, eighth, I'm unable to be hurt. Everyone, please just calm down, we won't be able to get our Nakama back if we keep arguing like this. She had to cut off protests coming from the more vocal members of her guild who were pointing at Lucy an example of just why they should fight against their rivals by raising her hand again, but this time, it was accompanied with a small glare. Her guild quickly shut up, to the absolute shock of Sabretooth, I understand why you're upset, but our guilds will have to work together to make this work. There is no anima to help us travel to other worlds this time, we have to make another way to cross dimensions. A blonde teenager with some of her hair in a bow raised her hand, waiting for Mavis to glance at her before she spoke. First Master Mavis, I think I have someone who could help us know more about this, if you would like me to bring him out. Mavis smiled at Lucy and nodded her assent to this plan. Open. Gate of the Southern Cross. Crux. Lucy called while holding one of her keys out. In a puff of white smoke a celestial spirit appeared looking like an old man with a silver cross for a face that floated endlessly in the air. He seemed to almost be sleeping. Hello old man Crux, Lucy said, would you mind finding information on crossing dimensions for me? Most of the people in the room stared at the spirit in disbelief, as it seemed to actually fall asleep. Hmm, seems like all your spirits are just weak wastes of space, girly. A black-haired woman spoke, her hair in two small buns at the top of her head, while the rest of it fell down her back. Lucy just smiled at Minerva, beginning to talk to her teammates as she waited for any sign of her spirit having found her information. The crowds began to be restless as the wait stretched longer until most of the mages fell flat on their asses as the thinking old man yelled out, Ha! Huh. Lucy covered her mouth as she saw Minerva's shocked face, she loved her spirits. The sound of the door creaking was like a funeral march to the Earthlanders, none of them knew what was coming up but all of them were prepared for something along the lines of more bullshit, some shrill yelling, and, of course, more bitching from the civilians about what was going on. They were right. As soon as Sting stepped foot into the room, a shrill cry of there cannot be another one. Rang through his eardrums causing him to snarl at the little girl who made the noise. She stepped back, her shimmery hair swirling as her eyes went up and down, examining Sting. She seemed to change to Sting then becoming the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. Even more beautiful than Yukino, a traitorous voice spoke from his mind, but it was disregarded because of the goddess in front of him. Sting began to move towards her, flexing his muscles as he tried to show this woman just how amazing he was. This all ended when a stinging pain caught his attention. He turned his head sharply, only to meet the eyes of his twin, angry and dark. I would appreciate it if you would stop doing whatever it is that is making Sting act like more of an idiot than usual, little girl. His eyes narrowed as the girl in blue focused her allure on him. That will not work on me. Fro thinks so too. A very tall woman said something quite sharply to the girl, who looked down in chagrin but did not look particularly guilty. I apologize for my student, though what she says is right, there cannot be a fourth champion, the giant woman stated resolutely. My dear Madame Maxime, if it were only as easy as saying that Harry will not compete, said Dumbledore, completely ignoring the glares and mumbled, not Harry, coming from the travelers behind him, sadly, however, there is the binding magical contract that has to be accounted for. As soon as Harry's name came out of the goblet, just like Victor, Cedric, or Fleurs, he was made to compete for all three tasks or else he would lose his magic. And where is the boy now? asked a man with a goatee in a brusque voice. Why Harry is right here, Karkarov, my dear friend, said Dumbledore grandly as he gestured towards Rogue with a hand. Rogue looked at everyone disinterestedly, though he knew that everyone else in his group was probably going to do something stupid. What are you looking at pube statch? Gajil bit out at Karkarov. Rogue denied his urge to face Palm reluctantly, and of course, as is with everything that surrounds fairy tale, Salamander escalated it. Like you can talk with that hair, metal face. He crowed. Immediately, Gajil was in his face and they were off, squabbling and gearing up to actually start fighting. To Rogue's great embarrassment, 
though he didn't show it much Sting was roped into the argument with a well-placed tease by Gajil about how Sting was the dimmest bulb in the shed. The three of them disappeared into a pile of wrestling limbs, all the exceeds bar Lily cheering on the fight. Rogue turned back to the wizards and ignored whatever the hell was going on behind him, they look absolutely stricken with shock. Rogue fought back a smirk at their faces. He had to be absolutely serious. He would be thrown aside otherwise. Taking a breath, Rogue spoke. My name is not Harry Potter, it hasn't been since I left this world. My name is Rogue Cheney, as I told Dumbledore before. Please address me as such. A heavy set man looked at Rogue confused. But but you're Harry Potter. That's what Lily and James named you. He blubbered as Rogue lost his cool for a second and glared. Nobody spoke up after that. The wrestling behind them continued to grow in fervor. Rogue continued to ignore them until he was mistakenly hit in the back by one of Gajil's iron poles. He fell slightly forward and then turned back to the idiots still squabbling. With the eyes of all the wizards on his back, he walked towards the pile and promptly tried to punch Gajil with a shadowed fist, accidentally hitting Sting instead who grabbed him by the neck and began to give him a noogie while Rogue, ever ready for this, grabbed Sting's cheeks and pulled. Lily sighed and turned to the wizards, I'm sorry for how they are acting. He said, You did pull them from a tournament fight, so I can understand, but still, I apologize. Looking through this, it seems that we can create an anima like opening to any world we wish with a combination of heavenly body magic, celestial magic, memory make, and territory magic. The only downside to this is that you need to know exactly what world you wish to go to, so that the people going through the portal don't get strewn across the multiverse. A slight young woman with bright turquoise hair summarized what she had read only moments before, red gale force glasses sitting on her nose. So saying something like, the place where Natsu is wouldn't work because we could end up in Edelus, or a whole number of other parallel worlds. A girl with short white hair said, her hand on her chin. Levy nodded. Another thing that this book forgets to mention is how we tell the spell exactly where we mean to go. I suppose that your runes, freed, could help but there is still the matter of knowing just where everyone is. The young man with long green hair nodded. I believe that I could be of assistance in that endeavor. My memory make allows me to hold immense amounts of information. Another young man with long hair, though his was blonde said, tilting his feathered hat. Lucy spoke up as well, I'll help too, there must be something that we're missing from this whole thing. My spirits and I will help you with finding information that you may need. Looking around. A large behemoth of a man grunted. We're done here. Sabretooth, with me. Let's leave these weaklings to all the work. One half of the meeting left, leaving the members of Fairy Tale bristling at the insult. Mavis stared after Giemma, her eyes hard. Ha rogue, my dear boy, would you please stop fighting so that I may ask you and your friends a question? Dumbledore said. Rogue looked up from the dog pile he was in and, smoothly detaching himself from the punching group, walked over to Dumbledore. He said nothing, but waited to be spoken to. The wizened wizard cleared his throat awkwardly then asked, whom would you like to represent in the tournament? Here, we have done it by school, but I understand if you want to represent something else. Rogue said nothing for a long while, staring at the long beard of the man in front of him intensely. Fury. Rogue said finally. I will represent our country of fury. A shout of surprise sounded from behind him and the wizards and witches saw the mages suddenly stop fighting at Rogue's words. Why Fury, Rogue? Why not our guild? Are you turning traitor? I knew that Yukino thing bummed you out, but come on dude she was weak. She lost a fight Sting was cut off by Rogue's stare, as well as a growl from Natsu and Gajil. I will not even try to reply to your stupidity. I know how you feel, Sting. Rogue said quietly. I chose Fury because here, there are no guilds. It's just the four dragon slayers, he said no more. His three companions glanced at each other before nodding, truce. Well, now that your affiliation has been decided, I believe that it is time for all of us to retire. We can continue discussions if needed tomorrow, but the students need their rest, and so do I Professor Dumbledore said. Minerva, if you would please show our new guests to their rooms? A severe looking woman with a tight bun nodded, of course, headmaster. If you would follow me, please. And, making sure that the four slayers were following her, she left the small room and led them through the castle up at least four floors until she reached a painting of a landscape with a bright blue sky and rolling hills. 
The most defining feature of the painting was a small dragon that was flying in the background. The professor turned to them, Here are your rooms. Breakfast is at 8 tomorrow. Have a good night. And then she left, leaving the group of humans with their cats in front of the painting without another word. Sue, Natsu said. Any idea how we get in? Rogue woke up blinking his eyes to rid them of bleariness. There was something different about his ceiling. He sat up quickly, accidentally throwing Frosh out of his comfortable position, waking him. Rogue didn't notice, however, too focused on trying to remember how he got to this new place. He looked to his right as he heard six other beings breathe, and relaxed as he saw the other dragon slayers and exceeds all sleeping soundly. That's right, he thought, we were transported to this place. He looked to his left and out the window, seeing the sunrise over the vast grounds of the school. His eyebrow ticked up as he saw what looked to be tentacles wave in a lake, but then thought better about putting too much thought into anything that he saw. This place had moving, talking suits of armor, what other crazy things could they have? A small whisper of wings alerted him that he was not the only one awake. He saw Gajil's exceed, Panther Lily, out of the corner of his eyes sitting down next to a softly murmuring frosh. They sat in silence watching the sky turn brighter, the darks blues and purples turning to light pinks and soft oranges. It was peaceful. That was all that was needed, especially now, after a day of hectic movement and discovery. Rogue still hadn't wrapped his head around it completely. All of these people thought that he was someone that he wasn't. They expected him to be something that he wasn't, something that he never would or could be. He had seen the eyes of the oldest man looking at him with what seemed to be calculation as if he hadn't seen a 19-year-old warrior, but a pawn. But, Rogue supposed, that could have just been because of the tournament. Everyone in that room had looked at him in varying ways, and most of them were greed. The sun kept moving as the two sat in their thoughts, no words being spoken. They would wait to talk when the entire group was conscious, and as the sky turned more blue than pink, the black exceed got up from his rest and moved over to his partner, waking him for breakfast. Rogue got up as well walking over to Sting and staring down at the drooling face of the other half of the twin dragons. Rogue raised his arms to be level with Sting's torso and simply pushed him off of his bed, leaving him to wake as a thud resounded through the room. Time to wake a more important member of the group. As Rogue gently cajoled Frosh into waking he heard the telltale sounds of Sting waking Lecter and an argument starting between Gajil and Salamander. Natsu, it's too early for a fight. Happy yawned, rubbing a paw over his eye. Natsu smiled at his friend and picked the blue exceed up, placing him on his shoulders. Sorry, buddy. How about we go to breakfast and get you a fish? Natsu asked, setting his partner's head nodding furiously. What are we all going to do? Apparently this is a school, and since we're not part of it, how are we going to fill our free time? Lily asked. Everyone looked down at the small panther and thought for a while. I don't know about you assholes, but I'm gonna train, Gajil said smirking he called to lily and left the room his exceed friend sitting on his shoulder rogue followed him shortly after with frosh in his arms he was not in the mood to listen to any arguments that would happen between sting and natsu the four walked along in a somewhat awkward silence as they followed their scents from the night before gajil cleared his throat you no rayos he started rogue looked at him gajil was scratching his head and looking at the ceiling i'm sorry I guess, for being such an ass to you when you were younger. He looked at Rogue and saw the semi shocked face and began to lightly blush. You're still a little shit though, got that? He sped walked away from Rogue, hands clenched in fists at his sides, mumbling something about stupid disciples making me feel all brotherly and shit. Rogue lips twitched in a ghost of a smile, he knew that there was something different about Gajil. Lucy slumped over a table stacked with books, exhausted. Guys, We've been going at this for a week non-stop, we should take a break. Looks of shock met her statement and she nodded. I understand, I mean I'm super worried about them and I want to get them back soon, but we won't be able to do that if we're all falling asleep while reading. We haven't slept for days, and our pace has slowed to a snail's crawl. We have to rest and take care of ourselves to be able to help everyone. The other three shared tired looks. Your reasons are sound, Miss Lucy. Rufus intoned. We should stop for now, I suppose. Lucy smiled widely, blushing. Please, Rufus, it's just Lucy. They all began to gather up their research materials and put them away. 
The four were just about to leave when a flash of light appeared right beside Lucy, leaving behind a figure in a black suit and sunglasses. Loke, Lucy said, surprised. What are you doing here? Loke began to talk without any of his usual preamble, shocking Lucy. Us spirits, we've been talking about ways to help you, and we finally came up with something. The lion spirit looked at all of them, taking in their drawn figures. While you all rest, I will be traveling to other planes, trying to find Natsu and the others. That way, you have that part of the spell and don't have to work as hard as you all have been. Thank you Loke, Freed said, his jacket rumpled. That was the hardest part of this spell to figure out. Yeah, thanks Loke, Levy chirped, a little quieter than normal. Lucy looked at her spirit, concern in her eyes. Be careful, okay Loke? I don't want you to get hurt. She was gathered into a hug by her spirit who murmured, don't worry, I won't be. I'm on team Lucy, remember? And, letting his master go, he got a flag out of nowhere that said I love Lucy, with a large picture of said girl on it as he disappeared. Lucy sighed, smiling. Same old Loke, come on, guys, let's go get some rest. And without any more words, she pulled Rufus along with her, showing him that she thought of him as a friend. Rufus blushed hotly, making Levy narrow her eyes in thought as she walked with Freed. Maybe a little bit more than a friend, she thought. Rogue sat down across from Gajil at one of the four tables, the hall seemingly empty, even though there was food there. Fro walked onto the table and wandered among all the different food. Lily following after him so as to keep an eye on him. Gajil stared after them, staring intently at Frosh as he swallowed his mouthful. So your frog, what's his name again? Rogue's eyebrow ticked in anger. Frosh is an exceed, he exclaimed, getting in Gajil's face. Then why the frog suit? And why is it pink? Gajil was smirking now. This was more like the past Rayo's. Be because he liked it. We were walking through a store and he saw it and asked me to buy it for him, so I did. Rogue was getting a bit flustered now. Are you sewer? Gajil teased. Maybe you got it because you just like cute things and wanted your cat to be more frog like don't think I've forgotten your fascination with frogs, Rayo's. You, you. Asshole, Rogue was blushing hotly now. Gajil laughed insanely, now this was more like it. This was the scene that the students walked into. Two of the strangers sitting at the Gryffindor table, one laughing weirdly. How does Gee even come naturally? And the other stabbing at his food, a small blush on his face. There were two pets, one a cat with a scar wearing pants, and another a green frog wearing a pink suit. Who were these people? Some students got shoved to the side as two more strangers, each with a cat on their shoulder, one was blue. How what? Arguing loudly and saying things like if you don't stop now light bulb, I'm gonna flame your ass. Which made the one dressed in an honest to Merlin crop top and feather boa lined jacket say, Oh, not Susan, I didn't know you swung that way. Which made the pink haired one, pink, punch the other one in the shoulder, which just had the domino effect of their squabble escalating. The two were pushing each other back and forth until they reached the Gryffindor table where they split up, boa man sitting next to the man in a cloak, while pink haired man sat next to the other man with wild hair that reached his hips. The students stood in shocked silence as they watched these four strangers eat with varying amounts of manners until their revelry was interrupted by a voice from behind them. While I am quite sure that our guests are the most interesting things that have graced our halls in a long time, there is a backup now, and I am sure we are all quite hungry. The students, dazed, walked to their tables, watching in awe as the men just kept eating and eating, until even they stopped as Dumbledore passed by them and said a few words to them which made them glare at him, and one of them answered him. The headmaster nodded, and the cloaked one was patted on the back by his friend, who laughed, and was subsequently decked of his seat by the man setting the other two laughing. A loud ringing made everyone look up at the headmaster who stood at the head table along with the other teachers. I have an announcement to make, he said grandly, and gestured over to the Gryffindor table where the strangers were sitting. Harry Potter has returned to us as the fourth champion, he along with his friends will be living here, just as the rest of the students, so I hope you all make them feel welcome, he smiled then, Harry, would you mind rising so that everyone knows who you are? The four men looked at one another until one spoke up angrily. Yeah, he does mind, old man. His name's Rogue, as he told you at least five or six times last night, got that? It was the man in white that had spoke up, 
while the pink frog had walked over to the cloaked man and placed his arms on the man's chest eliciting a smile. Dumbledore's smile fell a bit, before he sighed and smiled again. I'm sorry, my boy, forgive an old man's memories. Rogue Cheney, would you please stand up? And he did. To the shock of the three schools, the man with the long black cloak, sword, and frog clutched close to his chest stood, looking around for a few seconds before sitting back down. Murmurs flew from every student's mouth, gossiping about the new champion and his comrades. The headmaster spoke up again, cutting through the noise, and now that that is over, please enjoy your breakfast, and he sat down as well. The room filled with chatter and the four men looked around again. Well that was a doozy, Gajil said, Lily nodding with him. I hope that everyone back home is doing okay. Hopefully they're trying to find a way to get us back, Natsu said, handing Happy a fish. Sorry that it's cooked bud. He grinned. Happy shook his head, nibbling on it it's a good, he said thickly. Students stared at the blue cat. Of course it could talk, what next? Maybe it would sprout wings and fly. Knowing Levy and Lucy, they've probably come up with a way to get us home and are making sure that everything's going to be fine. Lily said evenly, looking for Kiwi. Yeah, shrimp and bunny girl won't let us down. Loke hopped through to another world from the celestial realm, coming into a dark forest. He felt for magic and nearly shouted, Eureka, when he felt Natsu's fiery magic. He disappeared again, now to get closer to him and to hopefully find the others. A bright flash appeared above Natsu who looked up at the scent of something familiar, smiling toothily, and then had to pick himself off the floor from the person who landed on him. The hall's attention was once again on the strangers. Damn it Natsu, I was going to look all cool, but you had to ruin it, the new person yelled from on top of Natsu, scrambling to get up. He quickly stood and brushed of his suit, fixing his glasses. I'm sorry it's taken so long to find you. But the princess and the others have been researching for nearly a week without sleep before the celestial spirit king gave me permission to look for you. Wait, hold up, kitty cat, Gajil said incredulously. It's been a week there? But it's only been a day here. I suppose it makes sense though, Rogue said. According to the others here, I'm supposed to be 14, but I'm 19. Yeah. When we went and partied with you guys in the spirit world for one day, it was three months in our world. Natsu exclaimed setting a fist down onto the palm of his hand. Loke nodded in understanding, and ran a hand through his hair bringing attention to his cat ears. I'll be sure to tell Lucy that when I go back to our world, Levy, Free, and Rufus should be able to use my information as to which world you're in to be able to set up a portal between here and home so that you can all come back. But Rogue wouldn't be able to leave. Frosh yelled, tearing up a bit. Rogue petted him between the ears and hugged him. Loke looked down at the little exceed in shock and then at the other mages. What does he mean? He asked incredulously. He means, my boy, that his magic is bound to this place until he has completed the tournament. Dumbledore spoke up, walking toward the Fury natives. Please don't call me that, I am at least a hundred years older than you, said Loke to the shock of all except the fairy tale mages. Now, that may be a problem. I'll deliver this to Lucy immediately, Natsu. Keep a lookout because I or the other golden keys will report back to you. We're the only ones strong enough to go through to other worlds without Lucy. Help. He did a mock salute and disappeared in a flash of light. Well, at least we know that Bunny and the Shrimp are working to help get us home. Gajil stated into the silence. Guess all that we can do is train and finish up that battle huh? He got out of his seat and walked away, not looking back. Rogue followed after him. Natsu and Sting the last to follow. Lily pointed Gajil out of the castle and onto the vast grounds he had seen that morning until the group was by the lake. He didn't, however, mention the tentacles that he and Rogue had seen that morning, and neither did Rogue. This would be fun. The Quidditch pitch exploded with noise as the four dragon slayers faced off, just as they did in their home world. Fire against light, shadow and iron. Feral grins alighted on each face but one, all of them with their blood pumping and their hearts racing. This is what was meant to be. Guild versus guild, families fighting one another in comradely combat to see who is the best. Great swaths of flame overtook the air as Natsu leaned low, his hands to his mouth. Sting retaliated with his own roar, this one of brilliant white light that caused many to squint as they looked down. The crowd's attention was stolen by two dark figures that seemingly danced around one another. One dipping into shadow, 
and the other striking where he was with large poles of iron that appeared from his arms. The fight seemed one sided, the dragons of light and dark beating their opponents soundly until suddenly, it wasn't. Gajil grabbed Harry's no, robe's arms as it coalesced out of shadow, thrown to the ground with a grunt. The crowd gasped. Natsu was also aiming his second wind, it seemed, striking Sting with a flaming uppercut, and then instantly roundhouse kicking him over to Gajil who slammed him with a pull to the ground. Now the crowd was staring at the to them savage violence that was taking place on the pitch. The other champions, Fleur, Cedric, and Victor stared at their fellow competitor in shock. If this is what they had to go up against, they were done for. They each found one another in the crowd, locking gazes and nodding. They would work together so as to take down this fierce beast of a man. Their attention was wrenched back to the ground as people screamed as Sting's newest attack was sent up to the side of the pitch, exploding the stands into flame. People panicked, frantically waving wands to combat the flames. All of them were saved by the unlikeliest of sources, Natsu. Natsu who saw the flames and abandoned his match, Natsu, who ran over to the stands and dived into the falms wrenching more screams from the crowd, Natsu, whose friends seemingly didn't care about him, still fighting behind the action. Natsu who was loud and ate too much, Natsu. Who consumed the flames quickly and patted his stomach, grinning at the terrified students toothily and then ran back towards the fight. Everyone was shocked. Who were these people? How were they doing such amazing things? Dumbledore was staring intently at Rogue, analyzing him. His eyes narrowed as he watched darkness go over his face and hands in something that released magic into the air, weighing down some in the audience. His partner was doing the same, though his was white. Could it be? No, that thought was preposterous. There was no way that Harry Potter could ever be dark, but, even so. He watched the rest of the fight keenly, never once taking his eyes off of Rogue. This would have to change if the poor boy were to ever get strong enough to defeat Voldemort. For even thought he was remarkably strong, Dumbledore worried that if Voldemort returned, Rogue would not be ready, and his short life would perish. And he didn't want that. The fight ended soon after Natsu ate the flames and regained energy. With his power up, he and Gajil were able to take down Rogue and Sting, even though the other two were tapping into their dragon force and using a powerful unison raid. It wasn't enough. The now younger slayers had more experience with fighting older and much stronger foes. They emerged from a cloud of dust victorious. The stands roared. Did you see that? And when he used his breath, what's that guy made out of anyway? Nobody knew what to think of the newcomers. They were powerful, yes, but from what they had seen, they were goofy as well, able to joke and have fun, teenagers, just like the students. But they were terrifyingly strong, even the ones who had lost. How had they gotten such power? Dumbledore stepped closer to the four now dusty mages with a genial smile on his face. He was going to get to the bottom of this, now. Rogue, my boy, he smiled, the noise formed the stands coming down as people realized something new was happening. Would you mind telling me how you and your friends came to have such powers? Rogue glanced at Sting, his eyes slightly panicked, he really wasn't good with all of the talking that he had been made to do. Sting nodded slightly and turned to the headmaster, smirking. Hell no, old man. You aren't getting shit from us. The stands gasped at the disrespect towards the vanquisher of Grittlewald. Natsu glared at Sting, slapping him up top his head and speaking. We're all dragon slayers. Lightbulb and Goth Boy are the light and shadow dragon slayers, Metalhead is the iron dragon slayer, and I'm the fire dragon slayer. Natsu grinned toothily at Dumbledore allowing him to see Natsu's elongated canines. So you all kill dragons? Dumbledore asked slowly. If that were true, it would complicate the tournament's plans. However, Natsu and Gajil looked at him angrily, while Rogue was guilty, and Sting's smirk lowered a bit, but he strengthened it quickly. Of course not. Why would we ever kill our parents, you monster? roared Natsu. Again, the wizards were shocked dumb. Why your parents? Dumbledore gaped. Natsu huffed, and got into Dumbledore's face, a look of fake concern on his face. Yeah, our parents, are you deaf old man? Dumbledore couldn't even process the insult he was too dumbfounded. Wizards that were taught by dragons to fight with elements, and Har Rogue wielded shadows, were either he or his father, dark. Umbrakinesis was a dark art, and he had to know. 
he must try to at least get Ha Rogue to listen to the prophecy and work with the order to combat it. So he did the only thing he could think of, and spoke again. If Rogue is the Shadow Dragon Slayer, does that mean that he is a dark wizard? He could be entirely wrong, hence what he said being an inquiry, and not an accusation. Rogue looked back at him insulted and shocked. Perhaps, Albus thought, this was a bad idea. Rogue walked slowly up to him, the shadows around him growing in size, scaring the crowd, but they did nothing. Rogue stopped just short of Natsu, who was still in Albus' vicinity, and hadn't moved for shock had frozen him, and gently poked him, gaining his attention. Natsu blinked and stepped away briskly thinking that Rogue looked like Lucy or Urza when they got angry. He was not getting in between him and his target. Rogue stopped moving and allowed the shadows to overtake his entire person as he stood before the old man who had the gall to insult him so. Him a dark wizard? He fought those every single time he went on a goddamn job. He waited for a few more seconds in silence and then spoke. Just because the element that I use happens to be dark in your world, it isn't in mine. Magic isn't about the type, it's about the intent of the user. I fight dark mages for a living that use things like fire magic and wind magic, things you would consider light magic, yet they use it to torture others and take money from the weak. We, as guild mages fight people like that. Please do not think that just because I use the shadows that I use them for a wrong purpose. He allowed the shadows to disperse back to the ground, and smiled weakly as Frosh immediately ran to him, his eyes tearing up from Rogue's speech. The nice moment was broken by Happy who flew up to Rogue and accused, then why did you laugh while your mistress tortured Lushy? Rogue looked down at Frosh and then up at Happy again, remembering how Natsu had busted into Sabretooth's hotel just for Yukino. I didn't, he muttered, shocking the fury mages. He turned away and walked back towards the school, talking softly to Frosh and smiling softly. Levy gathered her research materials and looked up at the gathered guilds as she finished her presentation, and so, with Loke's help, Freed and I were able to devise a way to open the portal while Lucy and Rufus were able to find a way to stabilize it so that we could go through without the portal collapsing. She looked to her master seriously and nodded. Makarov in turn looked at Giemma and grinned asking, I suppose we should choose the members that will be going to get our lost dragons? Giemma grunted and got up, leaving. Makarov stared after him confused until his daughter, Minerva, got up and moved towards the door saying, Why would we get those weaklings? They were too weak to surpass against a wind, why would they be good for our team? Come, Sabretooth. And with that, the rest of the tigers got up and moved towards the door, Rufus trailing along behind them and looking back guiltily. Lucy looked sharply towards Makarov as he called her name. Lucy, my child. Go to Rufus and tell him that he's welcome to come along anyway as well as anyone else willing to come along. Lucy nodded and sprinted after, grabbing Rufus' arm and dragging him into an alleyway. L. Lucy. Rufus blushed. Rufus, gasped Lucy, you can still come. Rufus looked at her confused. To the opening of the portal I mean. We're going to do it tomorrow morning at the guild, and you're allowed to bring anyone you think is trustworthy. She smiled as she said so, taking Rufus' breath away. Quickly Lucy hugged him blushing along with rufus and threw him into the street whispering don't be late rufus and running back towards her guild rufus stood in the street blushing and not knowing what the hell just happened dumbledore found the dragon slayers in their room the next day having a pillow war yes war not fight because these guys are fighting maniacs one of the two students chosen to show the mages around shrieked as a pillow came flying towards her head the war stopped what are you doing here asked Lily, coming towards the two wizards and one witch. Dumbledore smiled kindly down at the small panther, he liked this little cat he was the mature one in the group. I have come here to deliver to you your guides through the school, he waved towards the students, beckoning them in. One had red hair and was heavily freckled and dressed in shabby robes, while the other had bushy hair and prim robes and had a book bag placed on her shoulder. The young man is Ronald Weasley, while the young lady is Hermione Granger. This is it. Makarov regarded the children surrounding his small form with a serious frown on his face. Even though two of them were not from his guild, he still felt fond of them. Looking towards the mages he nodded and gestured sharply with his hand getting everyone but Rufus, Lucy, Levy, and freed out of the way of the spell casting area. The four mages began to chant, 
a golden magic circle surrounding them casting an eerie light on the faces of everyone in close proximity. A shimmering portal grew in front of the four, showing a green lawn with a large lake in front of it. Lucy, still chanting, brought out Leo's key and poured magic into it, silently calling him out. He appeared in a flash of light and looked around, taking in the situation. Yes Lucy? He said looking towards his mistress. Lucy gestured towards the portal a question in her eyes. Loke nodded. That's where Natsu and the others are, I recognize the magic of the place. He paused, confused. Didn't you need one more person for this spell? That portal won't be stable for you four to go into, how are you going to leave Lucy? Lucy shrugged, her eyes watering. Luckily for you weaklings, I followed my traitorous guildmates. The arrangement with the two Hogwarts students wasn't going well. It hadn't even started out well, what with Sting and the others laughing at Weasley's name. Rogue sighed as he tried to listen to the prattling of the witch in front of him. Granger was nice, but she had the annoying habit of always needing to be right, which pissed Rogue and the others off to varying degrees. It wouldn't have bothered Rogue at all, but coupled with Weasley's incessant need to talk with Rogue and address him as Harry Rogue was feeling more than a little peeved. The four dragon slayers had woken up that day grumbling more than usual. None of them were morning people, but none of them were truly excited to get up, not even Natsu. They were lead from their rooms to the Great Hall by Granger who all the while talked about the magic of the castle and just how they were able to do what they did. Rogue had found a little of it interesting, but then was offended when her theories turned to them using illusions to try and seem more powerful. He understood that she wanted knowledge, but to ask such questions as she had was more than a little rude. Sitting down for breakfast the Fiorians slowly ate, baffling everyone around them with just how much food the four could ingest. A loud bang distracted them from their food, and the large man that stomped into the room. Whoa, he's just like Gramps, exclaimed Natsu, pointing at the hulk of a man that was passing their table. Gajil looked at Natsu like he was stupid saying, no he doesn't flame brain, the old man's tiny. Natsu shook his head and opened his mouth to angrily retort but was interrupted by the large man loudly whispering something to the headmaster. There are people outside sir, they just popped onto the grounds, the hall fell silent as the aged headmaster stood up, gesturing for his teachers to follow him, come, Hagrid, we should greet our guests, as he went. The eight world hoppers exchanged glances and hurriedly got up from their places, moving to follow the group. Hermione grabbed onto Natsu's arm and pulled him back down into his seat. Why are you following the headmaster? That's incredibly unsafe. You don't even know who these people are. Natsu looked in her eyes seriously. They might be our Nakama. Loke guided the group, consisting of Lucy, Wendy, Urza, Gray, Levy, Lisanna, Rufus, Yukino, and her, towards the castle, gossiping with Lucy all the while. The others were looking around, assessing the area that they were in just in case. They had seen a large figure go into the castle as they had left the portal with Makarov's blessing, and were watching as a group of people came towards them. The two groups eventually met in the middle, both wary of the other. Maybe too wary, as the ones from Fury were getting ready for a fight each readying their magic in case things got hairy. The oldest one gave a genial smile and spoke to them. Welcome to Hogwarts, school of witchcraft and wizardry, just who might you be? Natsu squished his face closer to the glass trying to see just who the mysterious group was. He saw a flash of steel from the red-haired one and crowed in delight, turning back to his fellow dragon slayers. It's Urza. She's got one of her swords out. He shivered. I don't want to see her with her swords out, she's scary like that. Sting snickered at him. I guess you're not as strong as I thought if you're cowering at the thought of her. Happy and Natsu looked at him with wide eyes, their faces turning white with remembrance of horrible things. Gajil geehed at their faces, but turned to Sting. You wouldn't want to get on Titania's bad side, she'll cut you up like she did all those monsters during the pandemonium event. Sting then turned pale remembering just who Urza was. Happy giggled, but then turned with wide eyes towards Natsu who yelled happily. Lucy and Lisanna are out there, and Levy, Metalhead, but more importantly, Lucy and Lisanna. Come on Happy. He sprinted out of the Great Hall, Gajil right behind him. Sting and Rogue locked eyes before shrugging and going after them. Ah, uh, boys. Hermione seethed. I am Urza Scarlet, and these people are Lucy. She looked to Lucy who shook her head no, Grey Fullbuster, Wendy Marvel, Lisanna Strauss, Levy McGarden, 
Yukino Agria, Rufus Lore, and M.I. Minerva Orland of Sabretooth. A silky drawl came from a woman with long jet black hair. Urza looked at her with distaste at being interrupted, but continued regardless. We're here for some of our Nakama who were lost to us and transported to your world, would you happen to know where they are? She extended a hand and summoned a sword, twisting it around her hands and pushing it into the ground, not only as an intimidation tactic, but for her own sense of comfort. Dumbledore nodded, if not a little nervously, and introduced his teachers. He was just getting to Severus Snape, when a yell of L-U-S-H-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y came from behind him and a blur passed him. The blonde girl shrieked as Happy dove into her arms nuzzling into her s. Oh Happy, she said kindly as she noticed the exceeds tears, it's alright I'm here now. Do you want to say hello to Carla? Her kind act was interrupted by Natsu who picked her up at the waist and spun her around with a happy yell. She was suddenly let go and the girl with shorter silvery hair, Lisanna, was picked up in the same fashion. The short young woman with teal hair was being greeted as well, but with less enthusiasm by the seemingly gruff Gajil. Sting and Rogue trotted towards the group of powerful individuals, feeling incredibly awkward. Their awkwardness turned to fear though when they heard a silky voice ask from behind them, and just what do you two think you're doing? Sting and Rogue gulped and turned to fact their lady in trepidation. Everyone in Sabretooth knew just how sadistic she was, and just how quick she was to dole out punishments. In other words, Sting and Rogue were Ed ten ways to Sunday, and they knew it. My my lady, how good to see you here, Sting stammered, gazed towards the floor. Rogue tried to speak, but thought better of it. It was better to not even begin to try to explain, for his explanation may actually offend the lady more. It was better for Rogue if he let Sting take the fall this time. He'd make it up to him, but only if Sting got the worse punishment. You too, Minerva drew out, as if knowing that her words were like barbs, are coming back to Sabretooth, with me. Rogue cursed in his head. I'm sorry, Lady Minerva, but we can't go back with you. A heavy silence fell across the group and Rogue looked down in preparation for what was to come. Quick as a flash, Minerva was on him, hand around his throat. The wizards gasped at the brutality and the rest of the dragon slayers growled at one of their own being manhandled. Rogue choked and his hands scrabbled at Minerva's own trying with all of his might to breathe. Then the impossible happened. A green and pink blur raced towards Minerva and knocked into her, making her look down, shocked. In that vital moment of pause Gajil reached out and ripped Rogue out of her arms. He smirked a bit when looking at Rogue's savior, but it faltered into a frown when he heard Rogue gasping for breath. Fro thinks you is being mean to Rogue. Frosh yelled out, pummeling tiny fists into the woman's side. Minerva looked down coolly and merely flicked of the annoyance by putting a small amount of her power into her fingers. Frosh cried out in pain. What the hell is your problem lady? Gajil growled as Lily gathered up Frosh and brought him over to Rogue who cuddled him closely. It is quite simple, little fairy. He disobeyed my orders and for that he must be punished. That is the way that we of Sabretooth function. Minerva arched an eyebrow. Are you so weak to believe that all you need to do is be friendly to be strong? No wonder your guild is the worst in fury. Now it must be mentioned that all of Fairy Tale were bristling with rage. The members of Sabretooth, however, were looking down at the ground ashamed, Sting and Rogue less so, but both Yukino and Rufus, who had learned that friendship can be a strength through working with the others, were clenching fists and gritting teeth along with Fairy Tale. The wizards, on the other hand, looked horrified at the mages. Dumbledore gulped and looked around at his professors. He had to make this salvageable, Har Rogue could not leave until he had completed his purpose, that was non-negotiable. He stepped forward, wand in hand, and coughed lightly to get the attention of everyone. If you wouldn't mind, I assume that you're very excited about these boys coming home, and three of them may go home, but Rogue Cheney cannot. He has been entered into a magical contract that would take away his magic if he tries to leave. He pushed a twinkle into his eyes again becoming once more the grandfatherly persona. Now, shall we all head up to the castle and talk about where you all will be staying? That would be amenable, intoned Urza, relaxing her white-knuckled grip on her sword and allowing it to go back into her pocket dimension. Come, everyone. We will continue this conversation inside. Minerva squinted her eyes, glaring, at Rogue and Sting. Oh yes, they most certainly would be. The great hall was silent as the large group came in. 
Everyone had gathered near the windows, and though they couldn't hear what was happening, they had definitely seen it all. And, being wizards with little to no experience with muggle fighting, were just as horrified when seeing the woman with buns lift up their lost savior by the neck. When said woman stalked in the great hall with her head held high, all felt intimidated by her. The feeling only heightened when a red-headed woman wearing armor came through the door, glaring at the haughty woman in front of her. That intimidation quickly fell away when they heard the telltale sounds of bickering coming from behind her. Natsu was arguing with a man, a man with no shirt on. Most of the girls and some of the other genders felt themselves flush at the sight. Then came two blue-headed girls, both talking to Gajil and Panther Lily animatedly making more jaws drop at the small smile that Gajil held. After them came four small cats, three of which they recognized as the Slayers exceed, but the fourth one a white cat wearing a dress and pointing her nose up, was unfamiliar to them. Penultimately came a blonde bombshell, two silver-haired women equally as beautiful, in fact all the women were, and a blonde man with a ridiculous hat. Following them were Sting and Rogue, who were looking around warily and not nearly as confident as usual. Students if I may have your attention please, Dumbledore called. Whispering ceased as all faces looked up to the grandfatherly man. He smiled, it is my pleasure to introduce you to the fellow mage and friends of Rogue Cheney and his three friends. He turned to the mages in question and announced, Grey Fullbuster, Minerva Orland, Urza Scarlet, Yukino Agria, Lasana Strauss, Rufus Lore, Wendy Marvel, and Lucy. I'm sorry dear, but I didn't catch your last name. Lucy stared back at the man, inwardly panicking. She had told Urza to not say her last name as a way to not bring attention to the fact that she was an heiress, but all it had done was bring more attention to her. Her breath hitched as she looked at all the eyes staring at her. A paw on her leg brought her out of her spiral into a panic attack. She looked down and smiled gratefully at Happy who looked at her worriedly, she turned to Dumbledore. My last name has some bad memories attached to it, so I wish to only be known by my first name, if that is at all possible. She nearly fainted when he just nodded kindly, but a warm hand on the small of her back steadied her. Rufus smiled down at her kindly as she blinked up at him. It was great to have friends that cared. Complete and utter silence held the room at two guilds looked at each other once more. Makarov and Giemma glared at one another as Mavis looked on between them. She sighed as the glares intensified. This was getting ridiculous. She stood up between them visible to all and coughed. Giemma's glare transferred to her and she evenly stared him down. This child was not about to scare her into submission. Our plan worked. And yes, some people of your guild went across your orders, but now is not the time to think of that, now we have to think about how we're going to contact our team on the other side. She paused and surveyed her audience. I supplied Lucy with a communications lacrima for exactly this purpose, but we still do not know if it will work. We will test it now, and get any information regarding getting our mages home. If it does not work, we will just have to wait and see. She walked over to Makarov and nodded. Makarov raised the communication lacrima out of the bag that sat at his side and activated it, pushing magic into it with his hands. When it was glowing softly he said, Lucy Hartfelia. It was dinner, and the mages of both guilds were sitting at the table of red and gold, which was very much like fairy tale. There was a wide berth on either side, as they were being just as rambunctious here as they would have been in the guild. Natsu was talking to both Lasana and Happy, gesticulating wildly with a chicken thigh. Gajil was listening to Levy and Lily talk, sometimes adding in comments with a short gee. Sting and Rogue were silent, worrying their exceed partners. In fact, it was starting to worry their guildmates who were talking to Lucy, Wendy, and Charles. Gray and Urza were looking around the hall warily, talking in hushed tones. While Minerva, well, she was busy sitting on the opposite end of the room in her own little space at the table of silver and green. Natsu had just yelled out an unsavory insult towards Gray when a flashing light came from Lucis gasped, smiling, as she pulled the communications lacrima out of her bag, which instantly shut the whole group up. The Gryffindor table went silent as well, which instigated more silence throughout the hall. What was happening now? Hermione, who had been hovering closer to the people of Fury, gasped as Makarov's face filled the surface of the orb. She had never seen magic like this. Lucy, my child, how are you? Makarov's voice filtered through. Lucy smiled at her master and answered, I'm well, master, and I have wonderful news. 
Did you find my lost children? We did. Master, we're eating with them now. They ended up at a school of magic, and were being accommodated very well. When will you be getting home? Lucy paused. This was the hard part. Well, you see, Master, they too are having a tournament, but it is a magically binding one. Rogue is apparently from this world and his name was entered into the tournament and he was chosen. He can't come home until the tournament is over, or he'll lose his magic. What? Another voice yelled in tandem with Makarov, making Lucy flinch. A new face filled the Lacrima's surface, one that was glaring and very angry. Give the Lacrima to Minerva. Giemma demanded, eyes boring into Lucy's. She gulped and walked quickly to the Slytherin table, all eyes following her. She placed the Lacrima gently in front of Minerva and waited there as she listened. Giemma, seeing his daughter's face, instantly began to give orders. You are to stay there and watch for any mistakes made by the weaklings of our guild. You are to punish them if they mess up. Oh, and cast out our two little betrayers will you? They don't deserve to be in Sabertooth. Minerva nodded with a smirk. Yes, father, it will be done, she ended the call. Lucy walked back to her table Lacrima in hand, shocked. Minerva was in front of her with a predatory look in her eyes. She got to Rufus and Yukino. She extended her hand made a fist, and then pulled. Rufus and Yukino gasped as they felt a burning sensation on their guild marks. When they looked at them, all they could see was a faint red burn in the shape of the mark. They had been forcibly removed from the guild. Rufus Lore was a proud mage, though it hadn't always been that way. First, he was the son of an influential lord that was never allowed to leave the house or make actual friends. Second, he was an inquisitive soul that was always voraciously searching for and taking in new knowledge. That was all he had. He thrived off of the phrase, knowledge is power. Knowledge was all he had. Well, that and following orders. He was very good at that. He was so good, in fact, that when he was eventually thrust into the world with the orders of, make me proud, son, he set out to do just that. He was not prepared for any of this. Sabretooth's cruelty to its members shocked him, but he put it aside in order to better himself in his magic. When Fairy Tail came back he was even more shocked, though he hid it behind a smirk. Wasn't the Heartphilia heiress a member? The Grand Magic Games brought even more shocks, but he put them aside to follow orders and to crush Fairy Tail. And then he remed Lucy Heartphilia, and his world was turned inside out, she got him to break orders, to become friends and work with fairies, she even got him to give her a hug. And now he was out of a guild. He was fine with that though, as long as he had his friends, everything would be fine. Yukino Agria was a practiced mage, even though it didn't seem like it, she had lost her sister at a young age to slavers and hadn't seen her since. She had been alone to fight for herself, she couldn't, not really. She hid herself behind a mask that was cold and uncaring and started to work on her magic, hoping against hope that magic would be the key to get her sister back. She trained hard with celestial magic, a known similarity between the two sisters, and looked up to a woman she had heard was the best celestial mage in the world. Then Lucy Hartphilia went missing, and it was now her goal to be the best celestial mage in the world. She joined Sabretooth, an upstart guild with the promise of being the best and she had to reuse her mask to everyone that wasn't Sting or Rogue. She still had to use it with them sometimes. Only Rogue's Exceed, Frosh, was truly kind to her. And then her idol came back, and when she finally met Lucy Sama she found a kindness in her that she hadn't seen since her sister went missing. And then came her fight with the Kagura, and she lost. She had nearly been kicked out that night, had Rogue not stood up for her. But here she was, sitting amongst a group of people she hoped to call friends no longer a saber-tooth mage. And she was fine with that. She would find her strength through her new friends. Albus Dumbledore, as well as the rest of the wizards felt as though their entire day had just been shock upon shock. But honestly, that was to be expected from this group. They were just a bunch of abnormalities brought together. And he was concerned. Concerned that he would not get the support that he needed in the hopefully not upcoming fight against Voldemort. He would just have to try to convince Rogue to stay and defeat him, but he feared that it would be the hardest thing that he had tried in all him many years. He sighed, and put the thoughts behind him as he got up to confront the group once more. Natsu growled angrily as he glanced at the two mages clutching where their marks used to be. Why would you do that? He asked quietly, his menacing growl causing most of the wizards to fear him at that moment. Why you ask? They were weaklings. 
Minerva sneered down at them. My father and master told me to, and so I did. I took away the trash, finally. But Yukino's not trash, or Rufus. Why would you speak of your Nakama that way? Lucy nearly yelled as she grasped the two mages' hands in solidarity. HMPH. I wouldn't expect you weaklings to understand, and with that, Minerva walked to Professor McGonagall and demanded to see their rooms of rest. Professor McGonagall sniffed in distaste, but led the other Minerva to another set of guest rooms, far away from the original set where the rest would be staying. Rogue let out a breath. At least it wasn't like normal, Yukino, Rufus. He clenched his fist in anger, looking back towards when Yukino nearly had to go through that torment of a ritual before he stopped the master. That had also been the night that Natsu had crashed their hotel and yelled at their master, nearly defeating him. Yukino and Rufus grimaced in tandem in reaction to Rogue's words, and Lucy squeezed their hands, giving them each a sad smile. Yukino squeezed back while Rufus blushed underneath his mask. The mages sat there in an uncomfortable silence until it was broken again by a wizard. Specifically the oldest there. Would someone please explain to us all what just happened here? I seem to be a little lost. Dumbledore spoke to them all, looking at them with his piercing blue eyes that didn't twinkle as brightly as usual. It was Rufus that answered, his blush mostly gone, but the pain in his eyes lingering. In Fury, there are many magic guilds that mages join to help out the citizens. Yukino and I were a part of Sabretooth, one such guild of that nature. We, in the guild, were ordered to be the strongest and the best. We failed that, I suppose, by disobeying orders and going along with the rescue plan. We have been forcibly removed from the guild, which is very painful. The burns will linger for not much longer, but the embarrassment and shame of being forcibly removed from a guild will never go away. He looked down into his lap, but was pulled away from his thoughts as he looked at his hands currently joined with Lucy. His flush started back up again but he tamped it down as he looked into her brown eyes. I suspect however, that the disconcertion will go away soon. He looked to Yukino and she nodded as well, looking over to Levy. Their friends would not let them go. Dumbledore did not know how to take this. Their powers were seemingly limitless, and they seemed to be a tight-knit group that would not let the others go without great resistance. He could use this. If only he could convince them to stay, but he knew that he couldn't take them from their lives back home. He had heard what the cat person, Loke, had said to them one day here equals a week in their world. That was too much to ask of the young folk. Nodding, he made up his mind. He would explain the situation to them, and then ask for them to help. This year would be vital to see just what the fate of the world would be. Hermione Granger did not know what to think about anything. First, the name of a hero she had only read about came out of the Goblet of Fire, and then she was chosen, her, the outcast of Gryffindor to accompany Ronald Weasley in assisting the newcomers. The newcomers that had just shown off their awesome powers in a fight that had both scared and excited her. Finally, there was something more. Finally, she might be able to make friends. But she hadn't. She realized that she had been bossy and overbearing in the past, yes, but she thought that she had gotten over that. It seemed that she hadn't. She had tried to be a friend with the boys, but they just looked annoyed at her when she tried to tell them everything that had fascinated her about her home away from home, Hogwarts. She just hoped that she would be able to find someone that would want to talk to her. The rest of the day passed quickly, with the Fiorian mages laughing and catching up with each other and the wizards watching the interactions in amazement. The only one who wasn't laughing, however, was in her room near the dungeons trying to crush the feelings of loneliness that she had always felt. Thanks for watching.